Uh, and without further ado, please welcome Steve Yarborough. Uh, <laughs> I woke up with some back pain yesterday morning and um, have resisted the urge to eat Flexeril because I wouldn't want you all to think I had been drinking early. <laughs> um, so I'm going to do what a lot of people have been doing and uh, read the tribute that I was asked to write for the Sewanee Review. In 2009, my first year to teach at the Sewanee Writers' Conference, I attended the dinner for faculty at Wyatt and Barbara's, at which I mostly stood around in a state of mild discomfort. While I knew the work of everyone there, I was personally acquainted with virtually nobody except the Prontys themselves. In the mid to late 80s, I taught for three years with Wyatt at Virginia Tech and spent a couple of pleasant evenings at their house. On one of those, having heard that I played bluegrass, he put his mid-60s Martin D-28 in my hands. I played Wabash Cannonball and apparently did not thoroughly embarrass myself since he complimented my playing. The thing is that in 2009, I had all but given it up for the same reason that so many people with creative inclinations abandon their pursuit of painting, poetry, fiction, music, or whatever art they're drawn to. I knew what good sounded like, and it didn't sound like me. I'd been playing the same licks since I was 10 years old, and they didn't consist of much more than a G-run and some Maybell Carter-style hammer-ons. I don't think my guitar had left its case more than two or three times in two or three years. The fingers of my left hand had lost their calluses, so that when I did play, my ears were not the only things hurting. By the conference's midpoint, I'd gotten to know several people, and at the social gatherings, I invariably hung out with the poet Claudia Emerson, who, despite winning a Pulitzer, was about as down-to-earth as anybody I'd ever met, as was her husband, Kent Ippolito, a jovial man with a bushy beard and a taste for good whiskey. Tony Early, knowing I loved bluegrass, had mentioned that Kent was a fine musician, and I discovered we liked a lot of the same players, chief among them Norman Blake. Kent told me he planned to bring some instruments to the French house on Saturday night and suggested we play together. I told him that I wasn't very good, but was eager to hear him. I have never forgotten and will never forget walking across the yard that evening and seeing him standing alone in the dark just east of the house, a mandolin slung from his shoulder. The party was already in full force, people milling around on the porch or sitting in those big white rockers, everybody with drinks in their hands, talking about that afternoon's workshops or somebody's reading or the agent they'd just met with, and I couldn't hear him until I got within 10 or 12 feet. I don't know what he was playing. It could have been any of the countless fiddle tunes he knows how to play on mandolin, guitar, banjo, and dobro. And even though I subsequently wrote a novel about a bluegrass musician, I can't adequately describe his playing, except to say that his tone was pristine, his picking precise yet relaxed, and that when I heard his tremolo, that rapid but delicate repetition of single notes at the end of a phrase, for me, the sound of the party faded away. I was reduced to a single thought. I'd give almost anything to do that. Well, I still can't do that, at least not Kent, like Kent does it. But thanks to his inspiration and the decade that has passed since that night, Music has taken its place near the center of my life. I can play with Kent or anybody else without making a fool of myself. 
and I regularly write for Fretboard Journal, the preeminent publication of its kind in the world. An entire floor of our house is devoted to stringed instruments. The fingertips of my left hand are so thickly calloused that an iPad will not respond to their touch. <laughs> Last summer, when I played Will the Circle Be Unbroken with Kent and Morris Manning in the living room at the French house, Watt stood nearby, contributing harmony vocals, which was as it should be, since it all goes back to him and the special atmosphere he's created on the mountain where so many people's dreams begin to come true. Um, the more I thought about it uh, after I got down here, I felt like really the way that tribute should end was um, with just a very short piece of music for Watt, and I um, talked him into loaning me that old guitar of his the other day. I've, it's been in my custody now for three or four days. Um, I think the reason my back went out yesterday morning is that I had, I had lugged it around a little, and he's got like 20 harmonicas <laughs> in that case. <laughs> and it weighs about 55 pounds. Um, so I, I decided it would behoove me not to really try to bring it over here and stand up and play it. Uh, so I just recorded a little 35-second serenade for Watt uh, in the safety of my bed. And <laughs> That's the, the sound of Wyatt's guitar, um, so thank you for that, Wyatt, and, and so much else. And thanks to Barbara, the great staff here, um, all of the people in this room who have come to seem like family and have enriched my life so much. I'm going to read just a, a little bit from the beginning of the... Can you all hear me okay? Yeah. The beginning of the novel I'm writing... I've been talking a lot today about Alice Monroe, so she does come to mind again. She said that at a certain point in your life, you get your stories from your children. My daughters want you to know that's a damn lie in, in our case. Um, <laughs> I'm writing a, uh, a novel about a pair of sisters, but they grew up in Mississippi long ago. In Ella's recollections, their house stands on the east side of the gravel road, a cotton field to the north, an orchard to the south. It's a boxy little two-bedroom with sheetrock siding, hot in spring and summer, cold in fall and winter. They had a window unit, but it mostly just made noise. They had a fireplace too, but it stayed boarded up because one time they found a dead snake there. The orchard wasn't really an orchard. That's just what her father chose to call it. About halfway between the house and their neighbor's soybean patch languished a lone Bartlett pear. Some years the fruit was fit to eat, but most years not. She thinks the plot used to be a garden, that maybe at one time their parents grew watermelons and tomatoes and whatever else people in the Delta liked to eat, okra possibly black-eyed peas. Her father was not officially a farmer then, though he used to be. He drove a propane truck, studying electronics at night via correspondence course through the Cleveland Institute, which was not up the road in Cleveland, Mississippi, but hundreds of miles away in Ohio. Whereas he once spoke the language of agriculture, tossing around terms like hill drop, strict middling, and string out, 
He'd recently adopted a new vocabulary, talking constantly of triodes, diodes, and electrodes. One day, he went to Jackson to take an exam and returned with a certificate that pronounced him a certified electronics technician. From that moment on, whenever he composed a letter, he typed his name at the bottom, followed by a comma and the initials C-E-T. On the weekends, he repaired people's television stereos and radios. Years before she knew the term CD, she knew CB. CB stood for Citizens Band, the kind of radio that only he seemed able to work on. Why he failed to place periods in this particular acronym, she never understood. She accepted it on faith, along with so much else he said and did. Dear Mr. Stark, this invoice is a reminder that you still owe 1750 for fixing your CB on 10 12 74. Please remit at your earliest convenience. Sincerely, Alton Cole, CET. The reason she knows what he wrote in those letters is that he kept carbon copies of all communications, storing them in the attic in a large metal lockbox, which she found right before they moved out. She placed it sideways on the floor on an afternoon when she was home alone and hit it hard with a pipe wrench. She often thinks of the box, how thin the metal was, how it crinkled from a single blow, how little protection it offered in the end, allowing to come to light so much that he would have preferred to keep hidden in the attic of a house soon to be abandoned. They went to a private school. This sounds impressive, as if they were people of means. At various times throughout her life, Ella's younger sister Caroline, who in her 20s began to call herself Corinne and later on Cairo, would with practiced offhandedness remark, down south, I attended a highly ranked private school. The truth is less savory. Paying the tuition left their parents constantly broke, but the only thing highly ranked at the school was the football team. And it would not have been highly ranked either if it played teams from public schools, which by then the courts had forced to integrate. The school existed for one reason, the maintenance of segregation. All the white kids went there, whether or not their parents could afford it. To do otherwise would have summoned disgrace. The colors were red and gray, the nickname, the rebels, the fight song, Dixie. There were no buses, and many students drove themselves to school in nice cars. She and Caroline were among those that didn't. Their mother, who operated a cash register at United Dollar Store, dropped them off just before 8, then drove downtown, parked behind the store, and waited until the manager showed up around 8.45 and unlocked the door. In the summertime, when it got hot early, she often had to drive back and forth in the parking lot to keep the air conditioner running. Ella did not learn about this practice from their mother, but from a classmate named Kim Taggart. The new biology teacher had assigned them to dissect a frog together. This particular teacher would last only one semester, getting fired right before Christmas. She just didn't understand how things worked people said, shaking their heads. Every time a student used a racial slur, she issued a public reprimand. This kept her pretty busy. One of the things she didn't understand was that a girl like Kim Taggart should not be paired with one like Ella Cole. Kim's father, known as Tag, was a local attorney who'd represented several Ole Miss football players in negotiations with the NFL, his clients including a number one draft pick. Their house held a, com a commanding position on Bayou Drive. Actually, we say bio in the Delta, but then y'all wouldn't know what I would mean. <laughs> a plantation-style affair with white columns and a rotunda. It was spotlit every night. Thomas Jefferson might have felt at home within those walls. They owned another place, too, in the New Orleans Garden District, 
Word was that when Kim graduated, they'd sell their local home and move on. The town was too confining for people like them, even if they'd been raised there. Each two-person team had to pay for its own dissection kit and frog. Ella, nearly resituated up front beside Kim, reached into her bag to withdraw the two dollars her mother had given her that morning. But Kim, a glittering girl with long blonde hair that lay regal on her shoulders, said, that's okay, I've got us covered. She stood and walked up to the teacher's desk, handing her a tin and waiting patiently for change. She wore the kind of plaid wool skirt fashionable at the time, along with the white wool blouse. On her wrist, a hammered heart charmed wrap. For days, people had been trying to figure out who gave it to her. She wouldn't say. Kim Taggart valued discretion. She was Tag Taggart's daughter. The dissection began smoothly. Ella spreading the frog out on the tray and holding its limbs in place while her partner pinned them down. She had once watched her mother and grandmother remove the eyes from the head of a nearly slaughtered pig, then place it in a brine pot to make head cheese. She hadn't felt squeamish then, and she didn't now. Neither, apparently, did Kim. While most of the other girls, as well as a number of boys, wrinkled their noses and voiced disgust, Kim proceeded methodically, her gaze narrowing each time she pushed a pen in. I probably ought to be wearing contacts, she said. I think I inherited my dad's vision. Mr. Taggart, Ella recalled, wore wire-rimmed glasses with thick tinted lenses. He's got bad eyesight. Without those awful glasses, he couldn't even drive. What about your mom? Until now, they'd never exchanged a word, though they'd been in three classes together. My mom can see to Memphis and back. If there's a speck of dirt in the corner of the bathroom, she finds it. It's a rare day when she doesn't make me plod downstairs and grab the vac. Really? Kim pushed the last pen into one of the frog's webbed feet. You assumed we didn't do our own vacuuming, right? Well, I do all the cleaning. She makes me use a toothbrush on the shower grout. Hun, how do you think folks with money stay rich? I don't know how they stay rich. And more importantly, I don't know how they get rich. The other girl laughed and touched her forearm. I don't know how they get rich either. It happened before I was born. How they stay rich is to make sure they don't spend one unnecessary dime. My mother carries a calculator everywhere. She conducts spot audits of stuff like the sales receipt at the grocery store. She once pulled the thing out at Commander's Palace, and while my dad looked down horrified, she retabulated the check. She is the stingiest human being you will ever meet. Ella had never heard of Commander's Palace. As if she had read her mind, her partner said, Commander's is a restaurant down in New Orleans. It costs a lot to eat there. If you ask me, the food's often nauseating. Can you imagine turtle soup? She gestured at the newly impaled frog. It wouldn't surprise me to see our poor friend on their menu. The thing was, Ella had eaten frog meat. Her father and her uncle went gigging, then stewed frog legs for supper. Her aunt and her mom and Caroline refused to eat the stew and had bologna sandwiches instead. To Ella, it tasted neither bad nor good. It was food. You ate it. She knew in the way that she knew all sorts of things without having them explained that at this point, it would not be wise to reveal her culinary history. It seemed like something unforeseen might be happening between her and Kim Taggart, and she wanted to find out what it was. You're my curious one, her father liked to say, and curiosity's okay. Now, some folks will tell you it killed the cat, and maybe it did. But what they don't want you to know is that the cat's got nine lives. Please remit one life for one surprise. Kim fucking Taggart, Caroline says that evening from the bunk below hers. Are you shitting me? She invited you to dinner? Her sister is a year younger. <clears throat> when she was little, she slept in the upper bunk, but then she began to complain about feeling claustrophobic. So Ella agreed to switch. 
Nobody beyond the family knows this, and most will be stunned by it, but Caroline is prey to many phobias. She's terrified of cotton mouths, which is perfectly reasonable, but also of dust particles, which is not. <laughs> she's afraid of getting food poisoning, though she's never had it, and is always checking the dates on everything in the refrigerator and occasionally discarding stuff like buttermilk and orange juice a few days in advance, and this drives their father half crazy. She's afraid of dogs but pines for a cat, which he won't let her have. More than anything, she's afraid of the dark. Beneath her bunk, she keeps a small lamp that burns all night. For years, Ella has slept in a mask. She will sleep in one for the rest of her life. You have a truly foul mouth, she observes. Has anyone ever told you that? You've told me that like maybe about 500 fucking times. I find profanity sublime. That's what I'm doing when I use it, sublimating base urges. <laughs> what base urge are you sublimating now? To be frank, I'd like to kill Kimberly Faye Taggart. Kimberly Faye? When did you hear anybody call her that? Actually, I saw it on her driver's license. You saw her driver's license? How? Well, to be perfectly forthcoming, Els, for a while, said document was in my possession. Some statements take time to sink in. This isn't one of them. Six or seven weeks ago, during six-period gym class, several items were pilfered from the girls' locker room. The principal made an announcement over the PA system demanding that anyone with information about the thefts come forward. But as far as Ella knows, no one did. Oh, Jesus, she says now, surely you didn't. I hate to disappoint you. No, you don't. <laughs> she rips off the mask, swings her legs out of bed, and bangs her head on the ceiling. She doesn't bother with the rickety ladder. She, her feet hit the floor with a thud. Her sister is propped on three or four pillows, her smooth face serene, the tiny mole near the corner of her mouth scarce, scarcely visible in the glow from the night lamp. Though neither of them knows it, there's a running debate among a contingent of high school guys about which of the coal girls is hottest. Most would vote for Caroline, it's the dirty language, the wild red hair, the piercing green eyes, the bad grades she doesn't give a damn about, the rumor that she once got so drunk she had to be carried to the hospital so they could pump her stomach. An air of danger surrounds her, and the guys involved in the debate love danger even as it scares them. Nobody thinks Ella is dangerous. She makes straight A's, has pale skin, and hair so blonde it's nearly white, and she's got the placid demeanor of a Christmas tree angel. Which probably means, according to minority opinion, that if you could just get a few drinks in her, she'd fuck you up one turn row and down the other. That her sister finds satisfaction in her dismay would be impossible to miss, even if she'd never noted it before. But she has. She detected the same sort of amusement last week when Caroline, having been caught cheating on a test in the only class they've ever taken together, announced to their teacher, that's the last time I'll ever lift a finger trying to pass algebra. Caroline's pleasure is bound up with her own discomfort. It has always been this way. You stole from Kim? What did you take? A shrug. A few dollars. The driver's license. Her car keys. Jesus, you, you weren't, you didn't plan to steal her car, did you? Oh, hell no. That could lead to some truly bad shit. Now, I'll admit, I fantasized about pouring a quart of Daddy's Valvoline on the leather seats, but he'd probably miss it. And of course, if that happened, you know who would catch hell. This is her self defined position in the family. She's the bearer of blame, the beast unto whose back all burdens are strapped. She's presumed guilty until she proves herself innocent, and such proof is hard to produce when you're nearly always at fault. What have you got against Kim Taggart? Ella asked, keeping her voice down because she just heard their mother step into the bathroom. What did she ever do to you? 
You know something else? If you aren't careful, Mama's worries about you are going to come true. She's scared you'll turn into somebody's doormat. I heard her say so to Grandma right before she died. Ella reaches for the ladder, locks her hand around her arm. What did Kim Taggart do to you? She asks again. Do you know what was in her fucking purse? $143. Mama probably makes less than a week for standing on her feet eight hours a day. That still doesn't make it right to steal from her. I bet you she didn't even know how much she had. You want to hear what else was in there? I mean, besides the keys to her hideous little BMW? She ought to say no, and she intends to, but words fail to emerge. Two condoms, still in their packages, two of those little bottles of whiskey they give people on planes, and get this, a note saying, Brad, there's much more of me where last night came from. <laughs> Brad Moss is the quarterback, the most popular guy in town, reputedly being recruited by both Ole Miss and Auburn. People think he's the one who gave Kim the charm bracelet. He recently broke up with his girlfriend. Ella turns loose of the ladder and sits down on her sister's bed. Why are you telling me this? She asks. Why now? Because, her sister says, her mouth beginning to quiver like it used to when she'd posed a silly question. Is snow made out of cotton? Only to be met yet again by their father's derision. I don't want you to become one of her playthings. She already has plenty of bright toys. What have you got? What have I got? Who in the hell are we? When we were building the house, Mr. Taggart says, we had some, well, let's just say spirited discussions about whether the dining room ought to look onto the street or the bayou. I'll be the first to admit that a case could be made for either one, but I argue that every December, when the Christmas floats go out, we'd regret it if we put it up front. And of course, being a lawyer, Mrs. Taggart said, sipping from her fourth or fifth glass of red wine, my husband won. That's a simplification. Mr. Taggart gestured over his shoulder at the bayou, where a brightly lit Santa man to slay pulled by a pair of neon antlered reindeer. In my profession, it's often necessary to arrive at a compromise. So yes, we put the dining room where I wanted, but notice whose back is turned to the window so he can't enjoy the sights. Seems fair to me, don't you think so? Later, when the news about Tag Taggart hit the papers, she would feel no, measure of, no small measure of sympathy for Kim's mother. But that night, she couldn't muster a shred. If Mrs. Taggart kept drinking, it wouldn't be long before the lights and the float dissolved into mist if they hadn't already. On her, the view was wasted. Yes, sir, Ella said, that seems like a reasonable solution. Mrs. Taggart smiled into her glass. She lacked, people said, her husband's charisma. The only person Ella had heard say a kind word about her was her own father. In high school, Louise was a real friendly girl, he remarked a little while ago on their way into town. Even back then, that damn tag was just as slick as if you'd rubbed him in bacon fat. I wouldn't trust that scudder as far as I could punt him. When dinner concluded, Mr. Taggart pushed his chair away from the table and said he'd better get on down to his office, that he was working on an important case and needed to put in several more hours, even though this was Friday evening and Christmas only 10 days off. He said good night, and before they heard the front door close, Mrs. Taggart had drained her glass. Well, girls, she said, good luck with the dishes. She rose, picked up the corkscrew and an unopened bottle of wine that waited on the sideboard, and headed upstairs. Kim studied the remains of her dessert, a chocolate tort, for reasons that she would not have been able to appreciate or to articulate. Ella wished she felt free to reach across the table and pat the other girl's hand. That she didn't do it will bother her off and on for the remainder of her life. She will recall it more than 40 years later in a Boston hospice. 
Her regrets spool out as a short film, not a feature. Kim finally made eye contact. Well, child, she said, not quite mimicking her mother's tone. Let's get in there and see if the dishes bring us luck. What did they do that night? She and the girl who would soon, if only for a short time, become her best friend. To begin with, they washed dishes. Or to be more precise, they rinsed the dishes and lined them up neatly in the dishwasher and Kim closed the door and turned it on. Ella thought maybe the evening had reached its end. She'd been invited to dinner and dinner had come and gone. Better get ready to phone her father. Want to head upstairs? We could put some music on. Kim led her out of the kitchen and down a hallway onto which several rooms opened. When she had wondered what this house would look like from inside, Ella had thought in terms of objects, vases fashioned from hand-blown glass, brass andirons, Persian carpets, original paintings by long-dead artists. But except for some furniture, which didn't look all that special, the parts of the house she could see were nearly empty. The only thing hanging on the hallway wall was a photo of Mr. Taggart's law school class. At the foot of the staircase, Ella paused, stepped out of her flats, and picked them up to discover that Kim had halted too and was watching her. You don't need to do that, her host said. For the first time all night, she felt as if she'd committed a faux pas. My mom made me do it when I was little. I don't remember who we were visiting. Somebody with a two-story house, obviously. She started to bend and put the shoes back on, then thought better of it. If you don't mind, I think I'll just stick with tradition. Kim was standing on the bottom stair. She swept her hair out of her face, then leaned over and kissed Ella on the forehead. The kiss lasted only a second, but the confusion it caused lingered much longer. You're a sweet girl, her new friend observed. It seemed to Ella that she could hear herself swallow and that Kim must have heard her too. So are you. Nope. The jury's rendered its verdict that I'm the most heartless bitch in town. Junior division, anyhow. My mom's got the overall title nailed down. Her room was directly above the one where they dined. There wasn't much in it either. Just a bed and desk, a bookshelf and a stereo. Kim walked right through it, opened a French door, and led Ella onto a small balcony where they achieved a perfect view of the bayou. Which of the floats is your favorite? She asked. Probably the manger scene down there by the Main Street Bridge. What's yours? Mostly, I don't like them. But then mostly, I don't like Christmas. Why? That's a hard one. Kim hugged herself. It was a chilly evening, temperature in the high 30s, a few wisps of fog rising off the water. Supposedly, tomorrow offered a slight chance of snow. You know that John Denver tune, Please, Daddy, Don't Get Drunk This Christmas? Yeah, is that what your dad does? No, that's what he ought to do. I would, I do. Get drunk at Christmas? I get drunk at every opportunity. What about you? She'd had a couple of drinks a few weeks ago uh, with a new, another junior named Irwin who had invited her to the Halloween dance. He was quiet and kind, the sort of boy who got sent into a football game in the fourth quarter after it was safely won or irrevocably lost. His father, like hers, worked for the gas company. She had been seeing him at parties as far back as she could remember. That's, they'd once ridden a seesaw together for half an hour at the lake house that belonged to their dad's boss. After the dance, he asked her if she'd like to try some Boone's Farm. He said he had a fifth of Strawberry Hill. <laughs> she said, sure. So he parked the pickup on a turn row south of town and screwed off the top. The first thing that surprised her was that he drank direct from the bottle. The second was that he killed about a quarter of it before handing it over. He hadn't bothered to wipe it off. 
and she decided that doing so herself would be rude. In the end, it wouldn't have accomplished much anyhow because when they finally finished the wine, he slid across the seat, threw his arms around her, and pressed his lips to hers. This was not the last time a male would, would, would reward her with unwanted attention, but it was the first, and she behaved more or less as she would in similar circumstances for the rest of her life on nearly every occasion. She shoved her fist into his ribcage, prompting a startled cry that sounded like nothing so much as, oink, <laughs> don't do that, she said. In the dark, he looked unmanned, like he'd just missed an open field tackle and been confronted by his coach. I am so sorry, please don't tell anybody. I'll never do it again, I promise, not ever. It sounded as if he intended to take priestly vows. I'm afraid, she told Kim now, that I've never been drunk. Is that by design or due to lack of chance? I guess I had a chance that I didn't take. That was probably a mistake. Maybe so. Kim turned her back to the bayou, resting her elbows on the railing. The lights from Santa and the reindeer added red and green tinges to all that blonde hair. If you had another chance, would you take it? There are things you can't imagine about yourself until the moment imagination is no longer called for. Until three days ago, she'd never suspected she'd set foot in this house that she'd been riding by her whole life, that she would be standing on a balcony at night with the girl who lived here. Nor had she imagined she would say what she was about to. With you, I think I would. The other girl's smooth face didn't reveal much, but for a few seconds, Ella felt as if she were being appraised. Finally, Kim opened the door and went back inside, and she followed. When she got to the bed, Kim lifted the spread, jammed her hand between the mattress and box spring, and pulled out a pint bottle. Nothing beats four roses, she said on a cold winter's night. She reached for the wall switch and flicked off the light. She'd mentioned music, but never put any on. Instead, she sat down on the floor, her back against the bed, and Ella joined her. I'm guessing you don't know what bourbon tastes like. You guessed right. Tonight, I'm a prophet. Basically, it tastes like molasses mixed with rubbing alcohol. <laughs> but it's better than scotch. She turned it up and took a swig. If you don't like it, Ella said as she accepted the bottle, why do you drink it? Ask me again in an hour. <laughs> the taste was not as bad as she expected, but the burning was much worse. She coughed three or four times and her nose began to run. Wasn't that fun? <laughs> not exactly. She handed back the whiskey, promising herself that she would only take one more sip or at most two. Three at the outside. <laughs> Do your folks drink? They probably don't, do they? My mother doesn't. I think my dad does, but he hides it. He's ashamed. She'd often wondered why he didn't do it openly. Neither of her parents went to church anymore, so it wasn't like he feared Baptist condemnation. I think, you think what? I think maybe he just likes to hide things. That's interesting. I like to hide things too. Kim didn't slug alcohol like Irwin, just took a good sized swallow every five or 10 minutes. When she offered the bottle, Ella did the same. After a while, the burning stopped bothering her and she began to look forward to her next turn. Upon waking the following day, she wouldn't remember precisely what they talked about, but she knew they shared many secrets and the conversation had grown profound. She also recalled how comfortable she felt sitting on the floor beside Kim Taggart. At some point, Kim had kissed her again, this time on the mouth. It didn't seem strange there in the dark. It didn't even seem all that strange the next morning. I'll stop right there. Thank you.